Well, last week, we learned about the wonderful gift God offers to all of mankind. The gift of righteousness. That is, God making a person worthy of a relationship with Him. That's what righteousness is. The relationship was broken by Adam when he chose to sin. And everyone born, including you, has been born separated from their Creator. Yet everyone born has a desire for a relationship with their Creator. And, and some people have explained that as we all have a God-shaped hole in our heart that only God can fill. And we try to fill this hole on our own. We all know it's there, but some try to fill it on their own. Some fill it with spiritual pursuits, church attendance, religious observances, personal sacrifice. The list could go on about the spiritual things that people do to fill that hole. And then some will fill it with worldly pursuits, fame, wealth, excitement. And then, of course, there's those that are maybe even more real and they just give up. Oh, well, life happens. We all know people in each one of those categories. Maybe you fill one of them. History has shown that all of those pursuits return void. They return unsuccessful. They don't really satisfy the soul because it doesn't really solve the problem. Because the problem is sin. That's why we don't have a relationship with God. We are an offense to God, and that offense must be dealt with. The offense is sin, and the cost of that offense is death. So we're at a quandary in our natural self. We can't earn our restoration because a sinful person cannot make themselves unsinful. Death does not cause us Cleanse us from sin. It only makes it permanent. And this is where the good news of God comes in. He paid the price for our offense. And he did this when he died on the cross. The means by which we receive that benefit is an act through faith. It isn't by something we do. We simply receive His act as being done on our behalf and trust in that to restore our relationship with God. When we do that, we become born again. We become righteous. According to Romans 3.21 from last week, that is we become right with God. So you can... You can end right there and say, you know what? How awesome. I'm righteous. You can go around telling everybody you meet today, I am righteous. Because I have faith in God and He has told me I'm righteous. That should cause your heart to be encouraged and be filled that God sees you as righteous because of your faith. Now God wants us to understand the impact of this new reality in our lives and that's where we're going to see today from Romans chapter 4. The reality of being righteous. What does that mean in your life? That God has declared you righteous. What impact is that going to have? Well, turn to Romans chapter 4. And let's pray. Lord God, as we open your word today, I pray for your blessing upon the reading of your word, the empowerment of that into all of our lives to help us to hear what you have to say to us and then to prompt us to respond. We need your power to do that. And I pray that you would empower each one to respond accordingly to how you have spoken to them today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say about Abraham? Our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, 
but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. In other words, he earned it. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from his works. Verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. We'll pause there. It's going to go further as I develop the message today, but I thought, eh, can't be here for two hours. <laughs> so what did I want to focus on today? First off is, what do, what do we say? starts off with, what then shall we say? Well, we say works are important, is what we say. We gravitate towards works. We gravitate to the doing part. Because without work, nothing happens. We value work, don't we? Well, not in so much so in current society, but we did value work a lot. We still know people that value work, and I think everyone here does value work. In fact, stop and think about it. When we offend someone that we care about, what do we go back and say to them? I'm sorry, what can I do to make it right? Work. We gravitate to work. Can I do something to restore our relations? Can I do something to undo what I did? We need action to prove what we say is something we really mean. Because words are just words, aren't they? We can say it all day long. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How do we know if someone's sorry? They prove it by their actions. We impute that then onto God. We think our Heavenly Father has the same standard. Okay, God, I know I've offended you. What can I do to undo it? What can I do to earn your favor again? We think that we need to do something to undo our behavior. The problem is that nothing you do can undo something once it's done. Even in a personal relationship. Ultimately, they have to decide, I forgive you. You do things to help them understand your desire for forgiveness, your desire of change, and things like that. But ultimately, they have to decide, yes, I choose to forgive you. Well, God comes to us and says, I will choose to forgive you, not based on anything that you do, but by your simply coming to me in faith and declaring that faith results in forgiveness. We say works. God says faith. Because what we say when we say works, it results in boasting. Because the things that I do, I'm proud of. When I fix something, I want everybody to know this was broken, it's fixed because of me. When I make something, I, I like to show it up and say, I made this. I know our brother Phil here likes making pens. And if he hasn't shown you a pen, then you know he's probably got one to show off today. <laughs> it's kind of fun, isn't it? You make something with your own hands and you go, I made that. This was nothing before. This was just pieces before. And now it's a useful instrument. You should see the one that looks like a bullet. It's really neat. <laughs> I got one he made that looks like a coffee bean. I don't know why he did that for me. But. <laughs> we make things and we're proud of what we do. It's just a natural part of the thing that we 
really we have to fight that tendency to become so proud of ourselves. The things we do, we take pride in. It's one of the things that we all have to struggle with. If you're not struggling with pride, you should be. Because you're probably more proud than, you should, than, than you're even aware of. If our relationship with God depended upon ourselves, then we would take credit for it and pride in it. I am so holy. Would you like to be as holy as me? Then just come and talk to me. I'll let you be as holy as me. I would become so proud. In fact, that's why in Jesus' time, who were the most proud? When you read the Gospels, who were the most proud? The religious people. In current society, who are the most proud? The religious people. Because they're relying upon their own behavior. And they, they, that's going to result in pride. Yet that creates a problem. Because God says he resists the proud. So then religious people have to go out of their way to prove their humility. Which then makes them proud. So then they've got to show humility. Which creates pride. Now I gotta. Do you see the cycle they're in? It's an ever-ending cycle. It's never satisfied. He rejects the person that is trying to earn his relationship with him by his good behavior. It's that simple. Because that good behavior will result in pride. And we just read about it here. Verse 2: If Abraham was justified by works, he would be proud. There would be something for him to boast about. But he didn't. That's what we say. That's the problem with human thinking. But what does the Scripture say? That's what's more important than what I say. It's more important what you think. Is what does the Scripture say? Well, it says that Abraham believed God. That's what it says. Abraham believed God. Abraham was the example of all Jews. So Paul used him to help them understand fully about God's grace. So if you could go back in time right now to what it was like to be a Jew, and even to this day, what it's like to be a Jew. Abraham is the guy. He is the father of all Jews, is Abraham. He is the one that God came and gave the original promise to him. I'm going to create a special nation from you. And so Abraham is revered in them. And Abraham was given an example of someone that simply <clears throat> believed God. That's all. Genesis 12 gives us the calling of Abraham and the wonderful establishment. And God said, Now the Lord said to Abraham, out of nowhere, God just chose this man, Abraham, nothing of his own merit. God just chose this man in an, in an ungodly family, in an ungodly nation. And he came to God and he said, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land of which I show you. Out of nowhere, he hears this voice who he identifies as God and God says, I want you to go. I want you to leave this place. He could have chalked it off as a dream, his imagination, last night's dinner. He could have just chalked it off that, wow, honey, I had the weirdest dream last night. And who hasn't had weird dreams? He could have chalked it off as that, but he didn't. Because God made sure Abraham knew it was him speaking. So now we had a choice. God, I know that's you. You've made it certain that it's you. And when you hear from God, when you read God's word and he's told you something, convicted you something, you know it's God. The Holy Spirit has a way of showing you this is truth. Abraham knew this was truth. So now he's got to decide, what am I going to do with this? This is not going to go over well with my wife. This is not going to go over well with my family. 
How are they going to understand when I tell them that God has told me to leave? And they say, well, where are you going? What's your forwarding address? And he goes, I don't know. Why? I don't know. What does God want you to do? I don't know. He, he didn't know more than he knew. He only knew one thing. God said, go. So what does it say? Scripture says, so Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Simple obedience. He, he had faith in God and it was shown forth in what he did. But he showed that by believing God and doing what he told him to do. It's that simple. And thus began the nation of Israel. What we know now as Israel and the Jewish nation. He believed God. That's that simple. He just believed God. And the way you know he believed God is he did what he said. Very, sim very similar to the fact that if I said, hey, this building is going to collapse. I just made a statement of fact and nobody did anything. You're all sitting there. How come you're not leaving a building that I've just said is going to collapse? Because you don't believe that it's going to collapse. Yet if you came to believe that this building was going to collapse, I'll bet you you'd be leaving the building. Because your behavior reveals your belief. So his behavior, his action of leaving revealed his faith. It didn't earn it. Really important that we understand that. Because then it goes on to say that it was credited to him. It was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 5. Another way of saying that is it was a gift. It was not earned. His belief resulted in the credit. Not his action. We need to really understand that. If you're going to be good in passing on your faith to others, you need to help them truly understand that it's got nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with your belief, your faith. And what you do then becomes a revelation of that. His belief was credited to him for righteousness. He didn't have to do anything to obtain that. He was declared righteous by believing God. Same thing for us today. We learned that in chapter 3. Your belief in God results in your righteous declaration. Now we know it's not that simple. We know that we don't act righteously, don't we? And that's further on in the book of, of Romans as God then further explains what we call sanctification. He's not in that right now. What he wants us to understand is our standing before God right now. When you have faith in God, you are declared righteous. It's a judicial decision. You are declared righteous. You are credited with righteousness. Because then, when it's credited to you, the glory goes to the giver, not the receiver. When it's earned, the glory goes to the wage earner, not the employer. Right? That's what God wants. He wants, he wants the glory to go to Him for the greatest act in this world, which is salvation from eternal separation from God. He wants to have all that glory to go to Himself. He doesn't want to share it with you. He doesn't want to share it with me. He wants to have that glory go to Himself. So how is it credited? How is that Wonderful transaction take place. Real simply. By faith. It's that simple. The righteousness was given through faith. The faith is the means by which that gift is received. 
Some people might even say, well, that's just another merit. Another thing I have to do to receive it is I have to have faith and I have to conjure it up. You're missing the point of what the relationship faith has with the receiving of that gift. And I thought about that. Maybe one way you can think about this is I've had people come into my coffee room and they'll give me money to pay for coffee for Border Patrol or first responders that come in for coffee. And when they come in, I tell them, no charge. Because it's been paid for. Now, sometimes they'll think, oh yeah, you're the one paying it. And I'll say, no, I'm too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and once they know that, no, this is money that a fellow community member has given so that you can be blessed and have coffee. It's been paid for! And you just need to receive it. It's been paid for. And all they have to do is receive it. So they reach out their hand, they take that cup of coffee, and they receive it. Now they don't say, I earned it because I reached out and picked it up. No, that was simply the means by which they received the gift. Your faith is simply the hand that reaches out and receives the gift. We learn in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. The means by which you that faith becomes impactful, effectual in your life is the faith that you have. Not of yourselves, just like here. Not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works. Repeating itself in this verse so that you get the message so clearly. It's a gift of God. Nothing you work for so that no one may boast. Repeating what is said here in Romans. No one can boast of their salvation. You can't boast of it. You can rejoice in it. You can celebrate it. But you certainly can't boast in it. Because it's all the work of God. But what does it really mean, this biblical faith? How can we wrap our minds around what faith really is? And, and thanks to John MacArthur, he kind of got me thinking along these lines of coming up with an acrostic for faith. So in your handout, write down this acrostic. Faith. F-A-I-T-H. Five things that will help you understand biblical faith. It starts off with facts. It starts off with facts. You have to have the facts. And Paul has been outlining the facts here, right? God is righteous. You're not. You're going to hell. You're going to, you're going to die separated from God because of your sin. That's a fact. People need to know the facts. The facts about God and my relationship with Him. Biblical faith is based on truth. It's not a leap in the dark. It's based on facts. Truth. And then what you do with those facts, so the A would be, I have to accept them as truth. Accept them as facts. We go from knowing the facts to believing those facts. Kind of like if this building were about to collapse, that's a fact. And then you have to truly believe that what Mike just said is really true. I have to accept it as truth. A person must come to the point where they say, I know the facts and I accept them as true. Not saving faith yet, though. Why do I say that? Because in James chapter 2 says, the demons even believe and tremble. We know a lot of people in life that know the facts. They'll say, yeah, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yeah, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If I believe that. I believe He died on the cross, too. I believe He rose from the dead. The demons believe those very same things. And tremble. So biblical faith, saving faith has got to be more than just that. What's the next step? They must internalize those facts that they declare as true. That's something the demons can't do. This refers to taking those faith, those facts, and applying them to ourselves. This is why we say that you have to receive it into your life. That's how we communicate that idea. Scripture tells us in John chapter 1, verses 11 
and 12. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. They didn't internalize him. But as many as received him, as many as internalized him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So the essential step is to internalize those facts and believe on his name. And then we have another essential step of biblical saving faith is the turn. The T would be turning. This is getting to the heart of saving faith is the turning that results. I turn around and begin to walk towards God instead of away from him. This is referred to as repentance. Saving faith must include repentance. My repentance does not earn it. My repentance is a sign that I have it. I have that faith. And I turn around because of it. So don't think that your repentance is earning anything. It's a reflection of what's going on in your heart. Saving faith always results in the change of a person. That's why it's referred to as being born again and walking in newness of life. Now that you can also refer to trust, doesn't it? We trust in those facts. We've all heard of those trust exercises, right? Where you stand with a back towards somebody and you fall. I've never had enough faith for that. <laughs> Unless he's bigger than me. <laughs> But that's what you're doing. You're, you're saying, I believe that person is there. And I believe they're going to keep me from falling. They're going to catch me. So they've... they've let me catch up on my slides here. They've... they've uh, they're going to be there. I trust that they're going to be there. It says in Acts 11.21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. They turned to the Lord. Biblical faith is something that involves facts, acceptance, internalizing, and turning. So what's the H? What's the H? Hope. Biblical saving faith results in hope. This is the essence of biblical faith. Saving faith. Even scripture says in Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the essence of our biblical faith. Taking as fact the things that you can't see because you trust the person saying it. Biblical Saving faith not only contains that hope, but it results in hope. You hope in our current circumstances, and we hope in our future generation. We have a basis of that hope because of our faith. And we know we have a relationship with God, so I have nothing to be concerned about. I have hope. That kind of faith is the means by which we are declared righteous. When you have that kind of faith, you are declared a righteous person. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, hmm, I'm not righteous. Or you might even look at me and go, he ain't righteous. <laughs> There's a difference between what you're declared and how we are, how we live, and that complexity will be a future message. But right now, the point that God is trying to get across to us is our current state. At the point that we declare faith in Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous because of your faith. Not because of anything you did or are doing. We are declared righteous. Righteousness is the gift received through faith. So I want you to have a biblical view of yourself today. It's truly important that you identify yourself biblically and understand yourself how you are biblically. 
if you have never declared that kind of faith to God, you are unrighteous and rejected and separate from God, regardless of how righteous you might act. Think of it as a, a gap between you and God. He's over there. I'm here. And there's just this chasm between us. I want to be with my heart desires to be with my creator. You have that God-shaped void. And you might try to step and boom, you are down into this pit. Didn't get there. Now some people have bigger steps than others. They can get farther. I just now step most far, farther than most of you. Did I make it? Didn't, did I? Now some people can jump. And they could really jump. And they might get all the way over to here. What's the end of this person versus that? They're still at the bottom of the chasm, aren't they? <clears throat> Yet sometimes we take pride in the fact, I got farther than you. Good for you. We're still at the bottom of the chasm. We have to have biblical faith to be declared righteous. To be declared worthy of getting to that other side. And our faith in Jesus Christ is how we do it. Righteousness is the gift received through that kind of faith. Not how far you can jump. So when you have that kind of faith, God's declared you righteous. But he goes beyond that. And that's one of the beauties of this section of scripture. He says in verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. You have not only been declared righteous, but God says, I will bless you. Blessed because you are now right with God, your creator. The Greek word translated blessed is makarios. It means simply supremely blessed, fortunate, well off. Isn't that neat? You can walk out of here today knowing I am righteous and I am blessed when you have faith in Jesus Christ. Notice how that word blessed talks about our current condition. It's not about eternity only. It's about the here and now. He came that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. Now and forever. God makes a couple of wonderful declarations about those who have biblical faith. They are righteous and they are blessed. God is going to be involved in your life. Your relationship with God is restored and He's going to be a part of your life now and forever. Now I know there's times when you're not going to act righteous. There's times when I don't act righteous. There are times when I don't feel blessed, and there's times when you won't feel blessed. But it doesn't change the facts. And remember, that's step number one in your faith, is to know the facts. So when you don't act righteous, and you don't feel blessed, you need to say, hey, wait a minute, God. I'm going to believe what you say over how I act and how I feel. The same faith that establishes our relationship is going to sustain that relationship. Biblical faith, that is. Facts, acceptance, internalized, turning, and hope. That's how you're sustained. That same kind of faith is what's going to sustain you. And where does that faith come from? Where do we get that kind of faith? Well, it comes from the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you find your faith wavering then, that's where the faith comes from. And if it starts wavering, what should you do? Go back to the source. If you filled your glass up at the faucet and it's getting empty, where do you go? Back to the faucet. Fill it up. And that's the Word of God. God's Word will strengthen your faith. His word will take your eyes off of your circumstances. His word will reveal more facts that we will then need to grow our faith. Maybe the, his word is going to reveal another area in my life that I need to turn. 
away from and back to God. His word is powerful. And we need that intake of that power in our walk when our faith is weak. What great news. What wonderful news today that we have the ability to be blessed by God. Yes. Not that we have to do anything to earn that blessing. All we have to do is have faith in Him. That faith is what sustains you. That faith is what results in your being born again. And that's what you have to do each and every day. Not that you have to be saved each and every day, but you wake up every day and you say, Lord God, I have faith in you today. And God says, I'm going to bless you today. God, I, I have faith in you again today. Thank you, God. Or even God, I, my faith is weak today. I'm going to get into your word so that my faith might be built up. And he goes, I'm going to bless you because I bless those that are righteous and I've declared righteous those that declare their faith in me. Let's pray. Lord God, what a wonderful section of scripture of how wonderful you are. We boast in you today. We boast in your grace. We boast in your mercy. Not our efforts. We boast in your love and who you are. Thank you, Lord God, for making it so simple for each one of us mm -hmm. to be born again through faith and to be sustained each day through faith. For your grace is sufficient, not just for our salvation, but sufficient for our daily living. Thank you, Lord God. Praise you in Jesus' name.